We appreciate you being here. I'm Wanda Jackson. I work for Sarasota Memorial. I'm an outpatient care coordinator. So I help people connect the dot between the inpatient and the outpatient services. And this is? Uh, my name is Jennifer Williams. I am a care advisor for the Neural Challenge Foundation for Parkinson's, which is a local grassroots nonprofit that was uh, uh, started to provide educational uh, programming, support services, and social opportunities for our Parkinson community. And we work very closely together. We do a lot of services together. The things that Memorial provides, they help explain that as well. And the things that Neuro Challenge, we're very good with explaining and going back and forth on that. So the title this morning is Therapies and Services That Can Be Used to Help Minimize or Slow the Progression of the Physical dis Disabilities Associated with Parkinson's Disease. That's a lot. That's a mouthful. And so that's a lot of information. So the first thing I thought of is, you know, the joke, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So that's what we're going to try to do this morning. We're going to try to break this topic down into bite-sized pieces. So the first thing we're going to overview is what is Parkinson's? And Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative chronic disease. It affects the neurons in your brain that produce dopamine. And dopamine are the receptors that allow your body to do those involuntary movements, like walk, swing your arms. Um, and when the dopamine is lacking, it makes those automa automatic movements much more difficult. So it also can affect planning, control, execution of all of those motor symptoms. And um, again, it, it, it's something that um, those who are diagnosed with have to now start thinking about when they're walking, when they're doing a sidestep, um, all of the things that for, for those of us without Parkinson's take for granted. So there are some common signs. Many of us think of the physical signs first. We think of tremor. And that is usually what brings someone into um, their primary care physician's office or a neurologist's office is tremor. Um, about 70% of individuals with Parkinson's do have tremor, although not everyone does. Each individual with Parkinson's has uh, very individualized symptoms, and every case is different. So you may also see things like slowness of movement called bradykinesia, stiffness or rigidity, which is very common, um, where you see people, you know, very slow moving. It takes them a long time to get going in the morning before they have their medication. Uh, postural instability, which is those balance issues. Their inability to distribute weight on their feet evenly, um, as well as um, it, it affects their gait, their normal stride. Freezing is another debilitating uh, symptom of Parkinson's. That is where patients will actually tell me their feet feel like bricks. They're literally stuck to the floor. And um, we, will, we will go into some therapies that help with these particular symptoms. Loss of smell is another symptom. It also is a precursor to Parkinson's. So many people who have had the diagnosis look back and think, oh, I haven't been able to smell for about five years. So they link back from their diagnosis state and think, oh, I could have had this, or I probably had this disease five, seven years ago. Sleep disorders or sleep apnea is another one that can also be a precursor to Parkinson's. And sleep disturbances are very, very common with most of our Parkinson patients. Depression, anxiety, those type of what we call non-motor symptoms, the symptoms that are behind the scenes, the physical ones you see, you notice, but the uh, non-motor can often be just, um, just as difficult and just as impactful on someone's quality of life. Small handwriting. This is, this is something almost everybody with Parkinson's deal with, deals with. This is called micrographia. And that's actually where you'll start out writing at a normal font, and then it tapers off and gets smaller and smaller. Uh, fine motor. 
uh, the loss of fine motor skills. Yes, and oftentimes if you take a break and you maybe work your hands a bit or even reposition your elbow and sit at a different angle, you're able to do that, able to write a little bit bigger. Or if you just consciously are really concentrating on those bigger steps or that bigger handwriting, you can do it a little better. We can certainly make you a handout, absolutely. Certainly, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can always email the PowerPoint. Uh, decreased facial expressions. This is often known or referred to as the Parkinson mask. So many people with Parkinson's feel like they're giving a giant smile. And what we see as individuals is a flat affect. So oftentimes people will misinterpret how a Parkinson person is actually feeling. They'll think, oh, they're, they're not interested, or um, they're angry with me, or they're, they're, um, they're just not happy right now. And that's not necessarily the case. When you think of head-to-toe functional muscle movements, those facial muscles are also affected. Speech changes, this is a big one. Many people with Parkinson's will start to mumble or they will start out with a very uh, normal vocal volume projection and then taper off and get quieter and quieter and quieter. And oftentimes they are not uh, aware of the changes. So their spouse, their caregivers, their family members are often saying, what did you say? Huh? I didn't hear you. Can you repeat that? And so they'll often, there's often the joke that, the, uh, the, the, the non-Parkinson person needs a hearing aid because it has nothing to do with their speech. <laughs> it sometimes it does. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That can happen, and a lot of that can be worked on through a therapy we're going to talk about in a few slides uh, ahead. But um, part of that can be just relearning how to, to breathe through your diaphragm and really learning how to push that oxygen up to fuel your vocal cords and, and give that, that, that volume that you're looking for. And there's that fine line between reminding them and nagging them. So we want to remind him to take a deep breath, speak real clear and loud, and that usually will work for a couple of sentences. And with Parkinson's, a lot of times they'll revert back to a very quiet, lower tone. Exactly. Fatigue, that's a huge one. Uh, fatigue, as, as we age, we get more fatigued. Uh, with Parkinson's, the fluctuating daily changes that can occur and inability level can cause fatigue. Side effects of medication can cause fatigue. Stress, anxiety can cause fatigue. So there's a lot of facets and variables that can exacerbate fatigue when you're dealing with Parkinson's. And then the last one, uh, typically when you're diagnosed with Parkinson's, you have one chief affected side. So it may be your left or your right. Generally, through time, if you live with it for 10, 15, 20 years, um, it will generally become bilateral, where you'll see changes affect to both sides. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Sometimes if someone is sleeping all day, that could be a behavior that may be um, evident of maybe some apathy going on, some loss of interest in hobbies, um, depression. So when you, see, when you see your loved one having those changes where they just want to sleep all day, you definitely want to alert their doctor or their neurologist um, because those types of things can be treated. So we, oh, yes, ma'am.
Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. You are correct on all of those. That's, <laughs> that is a, a true assessment. Um, when, when you're dealing with someone with Parkinson's, the, the idea of multitasking kind of goes out the window. You really have to prioritize one task at a time and eliminate as much stress as you can. So, uh, you know, stress will exacerbate symptoms. So I often tell all of the patient and family members I work with, particularly my care partners, is self-preservation. Taking it one day at a time, taking time out for yourself, and setting a routine that is realistic for you that day, something you can attain and achieve. Don't have a to-do list of, as a Parkinson patient of 10 things that you want to accomplish that day. You're going to get overwhelmed, and you're going to find that your stress level is going to sky rise, and you're not going to be able to focus. Exactly. Yes. And helping. Yes. And understanding that. Yes. Yes. Cognition is a is a biggie. Uh, for most patients, uh, early on, there is a change in the ability to recall information. So many of your loved ones may find mid-sentence as they're talking. They lose the name of the person they were talking about. Or what was that restaurant that we often go to? <laughs> and age and, and that's age why it's is, hard to find out. Age is, age is a component, but you have to think again. The chemistry in the brain is changing. Things are slowing down. So uh, the ability to retrieve information is slowed down. Can think of it as like a file cabinet. You know, we all get input and input, and we file it in our filing cabinet. What happens with a Parkinson patient is they don't always know which file to pull from. So as a care partner or a loved one, instead of finishing the sentence for them, cueing them or giving them, um, yeah, cues, that will help them remember what they're talking about is much more effective. Yes, because stress will stop that recall. It gets so frustrated. And it's, for caregivers, it's really helpful to know the symptoms, both physical and cognitive, because you're more understanding. You understand that this is not something they're just, they're not listening to you. It's not that they're not listening to you. It's just part of the elements of the Parkinson's disease itself, that they really are trying, um, even to remember to take their medication. We have patients who have alarms set on their watch. The alarm gets off, goes off stand up to go to the kitchen to take their pill, part way to the kitchen, they don't remember why they went. So it, some of these nice devices are good, and others, you still, we still need our loved ones to get us to completion of the whole project. Exactly. And flexibility, remaining flexible with them, and then starting those conversations with other loved ones, older children, and letting them know, hey, give mom or dad a little more time. Speaking of giving them time. <laughs> giving them time. So with any diagnosis, there are emotional aspects to processing the diagnosis, to understanding how it's going to affect your life long term, how it's going to affect your day-to-day -day life, and how it's going to affect your family. And there are stages, and these stages are very similar to the stages of grief. So once someone is diagnosed with Parkinson's, oftentimes there is a denial phase. It can't be Parkinson's. I refuse to believe this is Parkinson's. Um, and denial is actually a, a coping strategy that can be quite effective um, as long as that individual is staying compliant with their medication and seeing their doctors. Um, I, I work with many patients who, after they're given that verbal diagnosis, I have to go in and talk to them about resources and let them know that I'm here to help. 
And literally, it's, it's a deer in headlights situation. Uh, fear sets in. Um, anxiety sets in. These are all normal reactions. So once they, they're angry, you know, the, er, the average age of onset is between, you know, 62. So what, what age is that? About retirement age. You know, so here you have individuals who are planning their retirement, ready to be done working and, and seize the moment and enjoy their lives. And then they get this, this diagnosis. Then it becomes the blame game. Well, it couldn't be Parkinson's. Maybe it's just a Parkinsonism or maybe I have just a central tremor. It's probably just stress. So they go oftentimes from doctor to doctor to see if they get any other types of diagnoses. And then once they get and hear from many doctors that, yes, this is, doc this is Parkinson's, they eventually become accepting of it. And they say, okay, this is part of who I am now. So I'm going to learn as much as I can. I'm going to get involved. And I'm going to create a support system to help me through this new journey of my life. And one of them that's not mentioned there that we've seen several times with Parkinson's is the same reaction my mother had. For many, many years, they know that something's wrong, something's not right, and they're misdiagnosed over and over. She had frozen shoulder when she was trying to do her hair, and they gave her shots and rehab, and it wasn't frozen shoulder, it was Parkinson's. So she had my mother, who is down here, the Wilma Mateka, she was told at one time, you're perfectly fine, go home and enjoy your life. So she thought she was crazy. So her first reaction when the doctor told her she had Parkinson's was, yes, finally, there's a diagnosis. It's not me. I'm not crazy. And we've seen that over and over with patients, that they're just so glad to know that they, what it is so that they can start accepting and making that plan to take care of themselves properly. So Michael J. Fox, we all know about his Parkinson's. He said, acceptance is the key to everything because my happiness grows in direct proportion to my acceptance and in inverse proportion to my expectations. And then there's my mom. She always said, life is 10% what happens to us and 90% our reaction to it. So, so true. yeah, those are words. Good attitude words is everything. Yep. It truly is. Positive attitude can change everything. So goals of Parkinson treatment and options. Really, our goals is to give Parkinson patients and their families the best quality of life. Like you said, it's retirement. Can I go on a cruise? Can I still fly at Christmas to see our daughter? Living well with Parkinson's and maintaining wellness and independence. And so there are different treatments. Again, not every treatment is for every person. It's very individualized. Medications. And getting medications, the right ones, the right time of day, the right pacing between our medications, eating the right foods that don't inhibit our medications. There's a lot that goes in to fine-tuning medications for Parkinson patients. And in May, at our Parkinson Wellness Clubs, all four of them, we have pharmacists that are coming to talk about that very thing. Interaction with drugs, because not every Parkinson patient is just about Parkinson's. They may also have diabetes or heart disease or other issues that are going on. Surgery is sometimes an option. It's an option for those with the tremors. It's called deep brain stimulation. And our very own Dr. Ken Vivas is here. He is excellent and he does a lot of these. And you can, Parkinson patients can get a referral from their neurologist if the neurologist thinks this is something that would help them. And then the ones that we can feel like we're taking control of, we can do something about it, is the physical, occupational, speech, and vision therapies. Population of Parkinson's has grown, and so have the therapies and the research for Parkinson's. And then exercise. And we're going to talk about a couple of these real quick. Sure. Well, a little of both. For my mom with Parkinson's, the eyes tremored. So, watch, so her eyes following to the end of a page, at the end of a line, was sometimes very difficult to stay on the same line. When she got to the end of the line, finding the very next line was also very challenging. So 
There's a lot of vision changes that go with Parkinson's. We do recommend Parkinson patients see a neuro-ophthalmologist because they are trained in that neuro side of their vision. And then there are vision techniques. We actually have a vision clinic. And our OT works with a lot of par Parkinson patients in training, just like we do with balance and gait and speech. Speaking of speech, I'm very sorry. I've got a really craggy voice this morning. So Jennifer's voice sounds much nicer. So I'm going to let you do the next slide, too. But just going back to vision, you know, neuro-ophthalmologists, there are not very many in the entire United States. And we have three highly specialized right here in our own backyard. Um, and also, you know, as Wanda said, the blurring, the double vision. But you have to think, too, if someone with a vision deficit doesn't know where they are in terms of their spatial awareness, they're going to be more apt to have a fall. So there's a lot of different visual changes that can occur that can affect quality of life. And if you want uh, uh, any uh, recommendations on local neuro-ophthalmologists, we can certainly uh, provide that to you at the end of the... A lot of times they'll actually work with a prism lens, which will help their vision. Um, and we've noticed as we've gotten more in tune with the vision components of Parkinson's, sometimes vision needs to come before the physical therapy because if your level, for me, I'm standing straight as here, my eyes are telling my brain and my body. But for a Parkinson patient, this might be level. And if you try to straighten them up, they feel like they're tipping. So that's when we're getting a lot of that balance and fall issues. A lot of times it, it starts with their vision. So what therapies can help minimize and slow the progression of Parkinson's? There are non-pharmaceutical, non-medication therapies. Uh, physical therapy is one. There is a specialized physical therapy for Parkinson's specifically. It's called LSVT Big. And LSVT stands for Lee Silverman Voice Therapy. This is an evidence-based rehab that uh, the National Institute of Health has studied um, where they see phenomenal results. And it is covered by Medicare. And as we know, if it didn't work, Medicare probably wouldn't cover it. So generally, you'll have that 80% Medicare will co cover, and then your 20% your supplement will cover the rest. But what LSVT Big focuses on is retraining your gait, teaching you to amplify your steps, your arm swing, trunk rotation, which is imperative if you want to maintain driving or sidestep or even get out of a freeze where your feet are stuck to the floor. Um, so fall prevention. And this, this uh, program is done, it's, it's pretty, pretty intense. It's 16 sessions, so it's four weeks, four times a week for one hour. And let me tell you, you're going to be tired after you get done with this. They are going to work and teach you seven core exercises that you're not just going to do for those 16 weeks. This is a lifelong commitment to do every day for the rest of your life. This goes back to that quality of life. We want them to be able to continue at the rate that they're at now. If they're walking, getting in and out of a car, in and out of bed, we're doing the exercises that give those core muscles the strength to continue to do that for that maintaining independence. To maintain your mobility. You want to be able to remain independent and, and, and function optimally for as long as you can. Speech therapy. Again, LSVT loud. This was actually started first. So Lee Silverman voice therapy. Uh, the core concepts of what they saw in terms of amplifying the voice and the exercises of the voice is what they decided to um, go ahead and try that towards balance and, and walking. So what they're going to work on with you in that is volume. How to get those diaphragmic breaths to fuel your vocal projection. They're going to have you enunciate words. You're going to, they're going to take a look at your swallowing. Swallowing's a big one with Parkinson's. Oftentimes, the esophagus, these muscles can atrophy and become loose because of the Parkinson's. 
so uh, many people will find that that's how they lose the volume of their voice, but also um, have some swallowing difficulties based on that. Facial expressions, they're going to work on that. And there's actually a wonderful video on the LSVT Global website that shows before and after of both of these therapies. And the, the woman that they, they interviewed for the loud therapy, she had a very flat affect pre-therapy. And afterwards, she was giggly, she was smiling. She was a completely changed person. This will be, both of these will be one-on-one -on -one with a therapist. So for the LSVT big, you will work one-on-one -on -one with a certified uh, clinician who's either a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. And then, of course, for the loud, you'll, you'll work with an LSVT clinician who is a speech therapist. If, if, if it's not one-on-one, -on -one, it's not the LSVT program. Okay? A lot of Parkinson patients will think that they can go to physical therapy. And if Medicare is going to pay for only so many visits, they think, isn't it better to spread those visits out over four months? Won't I get better benefit versus just doing all of it in one month? And that's not true. That's what the evidence base has shown. Because it's actually a recalibrating of their brain to know what a new normal is. And so we want them to be able to talk on the phone with their family, for their family to be able to understand them, for the grandkids to see grandma and grandpa smile. So we want to work on all these. And Medicare does pay for them, like, she, like Jennifer mentioned, four times a week for four weeks. That's the first time. Every year after that, 12 months in one day, they're eligible for a refresher course, which is 10 sessions. Because we know that Parkinson's is a degenerative disease. And so a year from now, we may not have kept up as well with our exercises. We may need a reminder. Our situation may have changed. So Medicare does pay for that refresher course as well every year. Not to say that if something changes, like a fall or some other symptom comes up like it does, um, that you're not eligible prior to the 12 months for more physical therapy. The number one question we get is, when do I start? People think that if they're going to take speech therapy, they need to wait till they're having problems swallowing or until everyone in their family says, I can't hear you. And that's not true because Parkinson's is all about maintaining what we have. So soon after diagnosis, maybe once we get to that acceptance phase and we're ready to take this on and be in charge of our physical well-being, that's when you start. You can start either one of these, depending on maybe the issue. Um, I wouldn't advise starting them at the same time because they are very intense. Yeah, you can't do them simultaneously. You could do them one after the other. Um, but, but again, it's no longer, Parkinson's treatment is no longer a sit and wait game. We don't wait for symptoms to, to come. We want to stay ahead of the symptoms. We want to get those tools in our tool bag to know how to fight and, and delay the progression of these symptoms. And remember, Parkinson patients aren't always going to be aware that they have no facial expressions. My mother didn't realize she had a swallowing issue. When I asked her if she wanted her traditional steak, baked potato, and red velvet cake for her birthday, she said, no, I don't like steak. I don't like salad. She does like them, but in her mind, she didn't because she knew she had problems swallowing. So sometimes as caregivers and family, it's very important that you know what's going on so that you can see these things maybe even ahead of them, realizing it. Yes. The mucus buildup happens because with Parkinson's, you have a decreased in your swallowing mechanism. So if you swallow less, the saliva is going to build up. Um, if you find that um, it's becoming where it scares her, if she wakes up in the middle of the night and she feels like it's flooding her throat, you definitely want to let the neurologist know. Um, it, you know, oftentimes they will send for a video swallow study just to make sure 
that that mechanism is working. And that usually is non-invasive. That just has um, the patient try different uh, consistencies of food and liquids. Um, but that can really help um, you know, give a diagnostic and, and, and clinical uh, standpoint and help the doctors. Um, yes, just keep in mind though, make sure it's not peppermint based or menthol based. Um, when you think of, a lot of people will suck on cough drops if they have dry mouth or they have mucus filled up. You have to remember those will stimulate the sinuses. So generally you're going to want to stick with a fruit pectin drop. But again, I don't want to, if, if someone's having coughing and uh, swallowing difficulties, I would say stay away from any type of hard candy. Talk to your doctor and, and get, um, get his advice on the next steps. And this is all really good news as far as the therapy. In the past, there wasn't a lot going on. And so the fact that we have all these wonderful therapies that truly make a big, big difference in their quality of life is amazing for us. You know, so we want to make sure we share these with you because they can make a big difference. So exercise. <laughs> exercise is almost just or more important than taking your medications every day. Medications will control symptoms. Exercise has been scientifically proven to delay the progression of Parkinson's. So in this area, we are extremely lucky that Sarasota Memorial and the Health Fit facility off of uh, Rand Boulevard at the Institute for Advanced Medicine offers specialized exercise options for people with Parkinson's. So like we said, Parkinson's affects overall quality of movement, stamina, coordination, um, the goal is always to gain a greater ability to simplify activities and to engage the areas that, and strengthen the areas that need to be strengthened, whether it's your core, your legs, um, anything that's going to help you maintain your mobile and optimal functionality. So the exercise options at uh, SMH Health Fit, there is a big strides with exercise program. And that is the umbrella for several of these classes. There is a pedaling with Parkinson's spin class that is offered twice a week. And that is a stationary cycle class that is, uh, generally you're going to be cycling between 80 and 90 RPMs. So it's a, an interval cardio training, a little more intense, obviously, than just getting on a stationary bike. Uh, it's done to music. And you have two two instructors in the class. So you have one who is your lead instructor, encouraging you, setting the pace, and then you have a floor instructor that's going around, making sure that your heart rate is staying within your target range, and making sure that you're comfortable on the bike, and just laying eyes on you. And that's the beauty of having a, a healthcare-based gym, is you have professionals that understand all of these different types of diseases. So they know what to look for, and they're there to help. Then we've got WAPI Movers. That's a group exercise class that is basically an extension of the LSVT BIG. So if you've done the BIG, or if you're waiting maybe to get in the BIG class, since it's this season, it's a very busy time of year, um, that will help you work on your stride. Uh, they, they do a little dancing. They do some singing. They do some seated uh, stretching. They do all different types of, of, of big exercises. So that's another option, and that's done in a group setting. Uh, Smart Moves, which is not available right now but hopefully will be, is the same concept, but it's done in a warm therapy pool. So those that may be... Um, have a history of falls or fear of falls, um, this is always a nice option for those folks. Because as we know, water is a nice cushion. The worst thing that can happen if you fall in the pool is you get wet. The warm therapy pool is about 98 degrees. 94, I 94. Think. So you have to think, if you're dealing with muscle rigidity and tightness and stiffness in your muscles, that water is just going to be a 
in a moment, getting in there. Um, so hopefully that class will come back. Um, chair Tai Chi, another seated uh, class where you do slow, articulated movements, which are all big movements. Chair Yoga, always important. Again, this is a lot to focus on just that well-being, mind over matter, to just decompress. You do some stretching, but really to just help you stay mindful of what your needs are and have that opportunity to relax. And the so whole, important. The whole goal, whether you're here in Sarasota and can take get the benefits of the Health Fit Gym for stroke or after a rehab, after a cardiac incident, after Parkinson's, but where you don't, and not everyone has that option where they live. So any of the gyms that offer these type classes, that's why we wanted to list them for you. Because there are certain classes that are actually more beneficial for Parkinson patients. And the whole goal, again, was to give that better quality of life, maintain the balance, strength, and flexibility, and the cardiovascular benefits of fit, good fitness. So a lot of our Parkinson patients were not runners. They were not people who were in a gym. So they're thinking, I don't know how to use the equipment. I've never been to a class. We can teach old dogs new tricks. So we just really want them to come out, and we make it easy to try it out. For $10, they can try the Whopping Movers class. And that $10 includes the Parkinson patient and their caregiver if the caregiver wants to participate. Or we have two-week physician referrals, which means that if a physician signs off on it, I think we have them in your packet, then you get two weeks to try all of the benefits of the gym, the hot tub, the steam room, the other classes. Because remember, we want to keep the caregivers, you know, standing upright and healthy and fit too as we progress together. Exactly. So we're so going to convince for those you why you need to <laughs> exercise. So, and this is a tough one because not everybody was exercisers. So the beauty of having a facility like HealthFit where you have different classes you can try, you know, once you find something that you connect to, you're going to be more easily able to invest in that class and want to attend. So this is why exercise is important, particularly for Parkinson's. It's a thing called neuroplasticity, and this goes back even to the Parkinson's rehab therapy. It's where you, if you exert energy and reintroduce new things, whether it's a new exercise, whether it's a new hobby, you can actually stimulate your neural pathways and get those things moving again, which will re-cement new information. It's pretty amazing. Alternative brain pathways are made and you gain strength, which is true. You know, oftentimes our patients that give a good, high, intense workout, they, you know, that rush is like having the dopamine back in their system. They feel like they don't have Parkinson's for maybe a few hours or a few days. Some of those who have lost their sense of smell after a good, intense workout, they can smell a, cop a, a, a pot of coffee brewing. It's truly amazing. It enables your body to produce the neuro, neurotrophons, which are chemi chemical substances to allow cells to work more efficiently. They prevent problems due to inactivity and muscle atrophy, so it's going to incorporate any time you want to get into an exercise program. Obviously, talk to your doctor, but you're going to want to make sure that you're, you're working on your flexibility, stretching, conditioning, um, and, and muscle resistance, you know, making your body stronger. Well, Jennifer, I think all of these can be said for all of us. Yes. Parkinson's or no Parkinson's. Exactly. But one of the things I really like is great for social interaction. Because for Parkinson patients, a lot of times their, their environment, their world gets smaller and smaller because of issues. They don't want to go out. They're not comfortable. They're afraid of tripping and falling or getting frozen halfway down the plane gangway. So the social interaction really works on that. And there is just something really beneficial about being involved in your own treatment, that you have a plan and you're working the plan. So there's just so much good in this. But even if they're not in a gym, to start small, we have one lady who has two small dogs. And she has decided, she takes them for a walk. But she has decided to walk them one at a time now because then she goes twice around the block. 
So no, it doesn't matter where you start, just start doing something. And then, of course, we have at the facility, uh, Neuro Challenge has started off Key Corral. Yes. So for many people who are combating the vocal disorders that can occur with Parkinson's, uh, science has proven that singing is a wonderful therapeutic intervention. So Neuro Challenge has a partnership with HealthFit. We utilize their space there and the Key Corral of Sarasota and the Artist Series concerts. So we have a corral, a singing group. It's called the Off-Key Corral, but they're not so off-key. No, they sound <laughs> wonderful every time. It's been a group we've had going for about three years now. Um, it's grown to about 50 plus members. Um, many many uh, Parkinson patients, their, their spouses, friends in the neighborhood, sons, daughters, they all participate. No singing, uh, no singing experience is necessary. It's just an opportunity where um, the lead uh, artistic director, Joseph Calkins, for the Key Corral, he actually worked with uh, a speech therapist at Sarasota Memorial. So he incorporates those concepts of the LSBT loud in that class and, um, and does that in his, in his breathing exercises. Um, so really, we just encourage people to come out, give it a try. It's a wonderful family, and we truly are a family there. And the next session uh, starts March 8th and will run through April 26th. And we will have a finale spring concert at the Unitarian Universalist Church on May 3rd at 4 o'clock, which will be open to the public. We're very excited about that. Nothing better than having it be lots of fun and good for you. So diet and nutrition, this is another key concept. You know, when you think of Parkinson's, you've got to think of the integrative approach. You know, the mind, body, soul. You've got to nurture all of those. It's not just medication. It's not just going to be physical therapy and exercise. It's going to be diet. Um, some of the side effects that can occur with some of the Parkinson medications is uh, constipation. Um, sometimes people get um, cravings for more sugar and salt. So really, there's no specific uh, Parkinson's diet um, but we do encourage folks to, um, you know, healthy greens, lots of fruits and vegetables, limit your salt intake, limit your fat intake, lean meats. Um, with the protein and the cinnamon, you will have to watch that a bit. Uh, protein will, if it's taken in conjunction with the cinnamon or the carbidopa levodopa, can, um, can uh, alter the efficacy of that medication. Um, and I do have a book in your packets which talks about that a little bit further. Um, but again, good healthy nutrition, plenty of water, staying hydrated will help maintain bowel regularity, bone health, balance medications and food for optimal results, as I said before. It promotes good digestion. Many people with Parkinson's have gastrointestinal issues where they may have a slow emptying of their stomach. Um, so uh, a lot of times they are seeing their neurologist as well as a gastroenterologist to, to, um, to deal with those symptoms. But all of these topics we've taken into consideration with our Parkinson Wellness Club. And so the Parkinson patients themselves, that population, has told us their biggest issues, their concerns, what they're dealing with, and all these levels. And we've incorporated it into our monthly uh, Parkinson Wellness Clubs. We hold one in Bradenton, one in Sarasota, one in Venice, and one in Northport. We do these monthly, and we use the same topic at all four. So if we're talking, like I mentioned in May, we're talking about medications. But we also talk about nutrition and how to balance that diet out because we need protein for our strength, but we can't take it in relation to our medication. So how does that work? Which proteins are better? What do they do? So all of our classes, whether they're fall prevention, nutrition, exercise, medications, we bring in local community experts, clinicians, and it's free. It's open to the public. You don't have to sign up. We have uh, the dates and calendars in your packets. And this is just an information time. And when these clinicians come in, it's a great time to ask questions as well. Because like we've mentioned, everyone has a little bit different. Then on the education side, we work with Neuro Challenge. We have our annual Parkinson's Symposium. Usually 500, 540 people attend that once a year. 
Um, and we bring in leading clinicians throughout the country to speak on, sometimes it's the newest drugs and services that are out for Parkinson patients. But even locally, we have distinguished speaker events in the different Sarasota County, north to south, and Manatee as well. And so we'd love to get you on the email if you just want to be given information on when these events happen and what's going on, and then you're free to attend. We do social events too, so. We do a lot of <laughs> events. If you ever want to check out even the Neuro Challenge calendar uh, on our website, which is included in your packet, you will see an ongoing calendar which will highlight any special and ongoing programs. But we put a lot of emphasis on our caregivers. So as well as the Parkinson Wellness Club, we have support groups. And we try to do them at the same time so that you can come with your husband or wife that may have Parkinson's and they meet in one room and caregivers meet in another room. We have different issues we're dealing with, different concerns. But I'll tell you the best thing that comes from that is learning from each other. I tried this, it worked great. I tried this, it didn't really help. So that support of each other, knowing you're not in that boat paddling all by yourself is really, really beneficial. And we've taken a page out of the airlines where it says to survive, you gotta put the mask on yourself first. You know, I'm always encouraging our caregivers, you need to eat right. You need to make sure you're getting your sleep. Sleep can affect a lot of physical ailments. You need to make sure you're seeing the doctor. I know there's a lot of doctor's visits associated with a Parkinson patient, but that doesn't mean you don't go in for your annual physicals. And so we are there for the caregivers as well because we know that's what's gonna benefit both as a couple, especially if you're going through those retirement years and you wanna do things together. We love our caregivers. So services that are helping our families. We, like I mentioned, we have the support group for the caregivers and the Parkinson partners. We have care advising appointments. These are phenomenal. Jennifer is North County, Bradenton and Sarasota and her cohort, uh, Carissa Campanella, handles our South County, Venice, and Northport. This is a one-on-one -on -one time where you can go over your individual complications, issues, find community resources. They're a great source of information. These appointments are free. Free, free, free. free. The support groups are free. The wellness clubs are free. The care advising are free. You know, I always tell people, no your medical benefits, what your insurance is covering. If it covers a mammogram every year, get a mammogram every year. You know, so to know these events are, that are happening in our community and then use them, take advantage of them, that's what we're here for, just to help with that. Jennifer, as you've met, is the care advising, uh, advisor for Neuro Challenge, and I'm Wanda Jackson. I'm the outpatient care coordinator. Here is our contact information. Please feel free to call us or email us if you have any questions or concerns. If your patient is coming into Sarasota Memorial, you want someone here with you, give me a call. I'm happy to make sure your staff knows about your timing of your meds, any concerns you may have. I'm just a resource for you while you're here. Questions? Because that's a lot of information. You gotta think all the way back to the first slides. What was my question? And our business cards are in your packet too. And mine has my cell phone number on there, so feel free to contact me on my cell. 